Welcome to Reading the Room, a literary podcast featuring author interviews and discussions with bookish content creators. I am your host, Jalen, also known as The Bar in the Bookcase on YouTube. I am so thrilled to be joined today by Lauren Groff, a three-time National Book Award finalist and the New York Times bestselling author of the novels The Monsters of Templeton, Arcadia, Fates and Furies, and Matrix. Lauren joins me to discuss her new novel, The Vaster Wilds, available today from Riverhead Books. Riverhead Books is an imprint of Penguin Random House, of which I am also an employee. In this novel, a servant girl escapes from a colonial settlement. She carries nothing with her but her wits, a few possessions, and the spark that burns hot within her. What she finds in the wild is beyond the limits of her imagination, and will bend her belief in everything that her own civilization has taught her. Lauren Groff's new novel is at once a thrilling adventure story and a penetrating fable about trying to find a new way of living in a world succumbing to the turn of colonialism. The Vaster Wild is a work of raw and prophetic power that tells the story of America in miniature, through one girl at a hinge point in history to ask how, and if, we can adapt quickly enough to save ourselves. Lauren Groff needs no further introduction, so let's hop into the discussion today. Lauren, thank you so much for joining me today. Thank you for having me on the show. Thank you. So I've been so excited about this. Um, Hunter is one of my good friends, so we always talk about your work. So um, it's been really exciting to do this. And so I wanted to start, you know, we we're here to talk about The Faster Wild, your new book. And I want to ask you, my favorite thing to ask about in this podcast is structure. And in many ways, this is a traditional adventure story, but I think you also subvert many expectations continually throughout the book. And so I wanted to ask you about how you landed on movement in this book for this character and how you landed on the structure of going back in time and coming back into the uh, main storyline. Yeah, um, so movement was really the dictates of what the story I wanted to tell. So um, I re I knew that uh, the beginning had to be a very horrible birth out into the new world. I mean, it's a parturition scene, let's be honest. Right? It's like going through the fort and into the new world. And as she moves on, um, I was trying to balance two separate uh, trajectories um, in terms of overall structure of the book. I wanted it to be chiastic in nature, and I, I um, which means in the shape of X in terms of uh, Greek letters, in which as she is um, moving through the woods and her body is disintegrating a little bit, she's also um, anagogically moving upward spiritually so the, there are two levels happening at the same time um yeah so so that was where the movement i think of the frontier narrative as it congealed in the uh, 20th century into like spaghetti westerns and clint eastwood all that other stuff is um really promoting the status quo right it's uh, these these stories are about um, the patriarchy, right? They're super macho. They're super. Um, they're they're about rabid individualism, and I wanted this book to be the opposite of that in some ways. I wanted it to sort of take these um, received ideas and then gut them, turn them inside out. There's two two things I want to ask you about that. So first one I'll ask is this idea in this book that I think is really fascinating about loneliness versus community. Um, and I recently read this book called Journals of a Solitude by Mae Sarton, which is basically a diaristic um, account of a writer living her days um, in a house and her just thinking in solitude. And it made me think about what this novel was saying, you know, kind of in conversation about, you know, the need for community and a quote that I wrote down that I think is really beautiful is humans were never meant to live alone. Um, so how did you think about loneliness versus community in this book? This is something that I think about in all of my books without always necessarily knowing that that's what I'm doing. <laughs> like I think we have these obsessions that we just come back to over and over again. Um, I really wanted this book to be a counterpart of Matrix in which, which is the previous novel to this, right? So it's um, uh, uh, 11th, 12th century, none um, surrounded by only women, right? Um, in an abbey. And it's all community all the time. And yet at the center is this rabid individualist, right? Marie is my rabid individualist. Well, I wanted to flip that a little bit for this one and actually do the opposite where we have this individual who has never been given autonomy in her entire life, suddenly um, being stripped, not of her own choice necessarily of community and then being alone. So, um, the, the the thing that I really wanted to think through uh, in terms of individualism versus community is one, whether or not 
we carry our communities with us, even if we're not there already. Um, to is there any salve to existential loneliness? I don't know. Um, and maybe three, two, um, is survival survival if it's uh also if it's alone, right? If it's if it's done in solitude, is that actually is that is quality of life something that really matters distinctly in this book? And of course, like it's a novel, so I don't come up with any answers. It's just a lot of questions like slithering along and becoming other questions. Yeah, I mean, one thing that I when I close the book, the ending of this book, I don't want to get into spoiler territory, but it, it's so beautiful. But also, I mean, this book is deeply horrific in many ways. And I mean that in the best way possible. I mean, <laughs> I I mean, same with Matrix when I was reading both of them, like I, I feel like in certain spots of the book, it could be like, kind of read as like a horror novel, which I love horror. Mm -hmm. So I kind of impose that on things that I read. Um, but does that resonate with you in terms of how you thought about writing through um, some of the more, I don't know, fraught aspects of the plot or, you know, writing into the body and how that kind of comes out in your writing? Yeah, I did. I wanted it to be both at the same time, right? Not just suffering. There also has to be ecstasy, right? Not just an ecstatic medieval um, mystic experience, right? Um, the ecstatic mystical medieval experience always takes place within the body, right? I mean, it's within the body he's suffering in particular as well. And so I wanted to transplant that idea into this separate book and, and think through the way that all of these things exist in us always all at once, right? There is profound joy, even at the moment of deepest sorrow. Some, and, and in fact, when um these moments in life when i've uh i've had a near-death experience there's also this weird thrill right there's this weird uplift of the heart um uh, that's inextricable right it's, it's part of being alive is this that if we feel deeply we feel deeply and ambivalently a lot of the times so nothing's ever like a pure emotion everything is intermingled and and more beautiful because of that intermingling this book you know was thinking a lot about about that kind of her being on the cusp of this sort of transition in her life um and how you kind of write into those things but i think a tie to matrix and something that i think you as a novelist do so well that it blows my mind like i'm not a writer but i don't understand how you do this is how you write across time in the span of like a few sentences and you do that in different ways um in your work but i'm wondering how you think about time i mean I, I feel like my questions always go back to this idea of like how much of this was like a like at the top of your mind while writing versus how much of it is like revision and you know the master work of like a novelist but i do think it's it's a feat to be able to ca capture so much time in such a brief page count so how in this book in particular did you think about moving through that time for her right so uh all narratives have three elements in them and uh, especially fictional narratives because our our method is really just to, to mold time through words, right? So we have analepsis, paralepsis, and ellipsis, right? So um, analepsis is flashback, uh, paralepsis is flash forward, ellipsis is uh, within the span of a very short time, time folding. It's basically folding time, right? And so, and so in this particular book, uh, I knew that I needed only a little bit of analysis, right? So we're only slipping into the past just a little bit, but my forward momentum was actually going to happen um, as swiftly and economically as possible. And so the moments that I am really playing with time, I, I am trying to do that in in sort of more, a more elliptical form. So, so that it's really, really, um, uh, it, it bends and it bends back within a short period of time because because of the fact that this book, if you look at it just as like a straight up narrative, it it is relatively simple, right? It's a girl leaves and then she goes through the wilderness, right? I mean, the, it, it, one can talk about this book in its entirety in one sentence. And yet um, there is a lot of just shivering underneath the surface. And I want that shivering to, to happen in smaller and more economical ways than these big leaps forward, leaps backward, like the the larger, more operatic, like uh, Moby Dick style books um, do so beautifully, but in in really big spots. This this had to be smaller. Yeah, I mean, I I'm gonna save a question for you to the end because you and I share a favorite book, uh, Middlemarch, and I I could I wanted to like make this podcast kind of about Middlemarch as tied to this book, but I didn't want to be too it. obnoxious doing that. But so <laughs> I mean, before we get there and and what 
that book does and why I love it so much um, is, so for this, you're also a short story writer. So I'm, I'm always curious as to how writers land on choosing a novel as a form for a story versus a short story or something else. Um, like, how did you know that a novel was the right form for this story? So uh, for me, they're so profoundly different that I just know from the beginning, but I, I think it's in, through thinking about it over the years, I think it's because I know something is a novel when I know that I can stare at it for five years, and not get sick of it, right? If I know that there's something there, um, there are questions there too deep for me ever to touch, right? In a short story, at this point, I've been writing them every single day for uh, 25 years. So um, I, I think about a short story for probably, nowadays it's, it's more like 10 years before I ever sit down to actually write it. So by the time I finish, uh, like I write, finish the first draft of a short story, it's almost like a remembered text because I've been thinking about it so deeply for so long. And in, and so I know the the size and the scope of it most of the time. A lot of times I do have to rewrite um, for language, for all sorts of other things. But um, with a novel, I know there's something really sticky, really unusual there, something that um, I'm not going to get on the first few drafts, but I hope I'm going to work my way forward. It's really just a, I think it's a question of actual, of gravity as opposed to anything else. Not to say that short stories don't have gravity, but the gravity is different. And I mean, completely different from that is Middlemarch, which is a huge tome of a book. Um, but I wanted to bring that book up in relation to how this book explores ideas of faith and God, because something that, I mean, this, I don't know, it blew my mind when I read Middlemarch, but just kind of the, this idea of this kind of like godlike figure overseeing the book is something that I think mm -hmm. is so fun, especially knowing that Lauren Groff is writing the story that I'm reading, kind of taking a step back from being so immersed mm -hmm. in the action, you know what I mean? And at the end of the book, without spoiling the, the final sentence, I love so much. It's, and feel it now, so soft, so eternal, this wind against your good and loving skin. So it's this direct call or, I don't know, statement to the reader, I, I, that's how I read it at least. Mm -hmm. and you know, tying that to the kind of how what George Eliot was doing in, in that book. Um, I guess this is an open for question for you to talk about Middle March in any way that it might have influenced this book and how you think yeah. about faith in God and like having an authorial presence in your in your work. I love Middle March so much. I'm so happy to, to find a fellow Middle March fan. Um, and the thing that George Eliot does in that book, which it's even though other people have done it um, and other people still do it is her authorial voice is so warm and all encompassing. It's almost like this perfect golden cloud that descends upon you. And it's uh, in some ways it is a God voice, right? Because it's, it's just as wise, right? It's just as capacious and her thinking always bends toward um, kindness and generosity in a way that I, I think it's hard to define. Uh, and so every book that I write has some, I, I look back at Middle Bar March as, as one of my beloved um, touchstones. Um, and in this book, something that I think is, is speaking back into Middle March, maybe just the, the sort of the God voice coming down and coming back, right? She, uh, George Eliot does that so well, right? There are these, um, of course, these scenes where you forget about the presence of the omniscient voice. And then these scenes where the voice comes in and, and talks about the squirrel's heart beating, um, the silence that lies on the others, oh wait, with the, the something that lies on the other side of silence. What is it? The noise, the, oh shit, I'm sorry. I'm gonna mess it I'm I'm up. Too. I, know, I know the quote you're yeah. mentioning though, yeah. I, 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 by heart, I right? just like messing it up. So, so these moments of scope and almost telescoping, right? Large and and the idea of the authorial voice as vertical, not horizontal. Right? The story itself is horizontal in some ways, or rhizome shaped in some ways. But the authorial voice can come in vertically um, from above down to the roots and back again, and and do like almost slicing through the text itself. And I thought if you find that. That sense of um, multi-dimensionality is something that I seek in almost everything I want to write, which is also part of, I mean, I think, tell me if I'm wrong and if your opinion is different, but I think right now in the 21st century, um, the the majority of books in the world are actually in the first person, I would say, especially short stories. I mean, I just read for the O. Henry Prize and like, I would say probably 80% of the stories I got were 
uh, in the first person. And it may be because the third person um, has lost its attractiveness because we have become a more secular society in literary in literature um i don't know why but um i like the third person even though it feels maybe a tool of the past because you can do this verticality of of attention within a horizontal text yeah i mean tying this book i mean to what you're doing in matrix as well i mean i'm wondering you know, you're you're pretty you're a seasoned novelist now. You're pretty far into your career. Um, seasoned, <laughs> uh, salt and pepper, baby. <laughs> I guess I'm like wondering how, like, when you're approaching a book now. I mean, and the idea of this project of being, you know, as part of a triptych, which I've heard um, mm -hmm. through the grapevine, and like, what did you take from Matrix and that experience writing that book into the Vaster Wilds? I'm I'm making an assumption that you wrote this after. Um, and like, what are you going to take from? The Bachelor Wild into future work. Like, do you do you see novels that you write as like a learning tool for yourself as a writer? Or do you kind of see it as like a encapsulation of your mind at the time, and then it kind of just goes, you put it away, and you do something new for yourself? It's all it's all mixed up, right? I mean, nothing's pure. There's no such thing as purity. It doesn't exist. Um, so I think, um, I do see individual books as little uh, brief. I guess even videos of my mind over the course of however many years it takes to to make that book at the same time i write a lot of books all at the same time and they're obviously talking to each other and i'm very intentionally intentionally in every book that i write i try in some ways to to maybe kick out the legs of the previous book and in, in um and so this book is is taking some of the thematic ideas in matrix and saying wait a second is this true right is this is this um given actually a given is this something that we actually need to um take into ourselves as received knowledge or can we question it as well so um yeah for instance um my second novel, Arcadia, was a direct refutation of my first novel, The Monsters of Templeton, in terms of everything, in terms of style, place, everything. And then, um, yeah, I think probably the next book, if I ever end up finishing it, will be both um, in chorus with Matrix and the Bastard Wilds, but also um, in refutation of. And um, I, I like that complexity and that ambivalence, right? So that it's not purely one thing or another. It's 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 all mixed up. That makes me want to ask you about, you know, your your reading life. I'm wondering for you what your reading life looks like. With two of my really good friends, we we once in a while, oh, not once in a while, probably six times a year, we pick a book and we read read that book together. And sometimes it's Vanity Fair, like Thackeray, and then so um, other times it's um, Wesley Grossman's. Um, life and fate. Um, but most recently, it was Moby Dick. And I have to tell you, I read Moby Dick when I was maybe 23. It actually gave me permission to write my first novel. Like, I couldn't write it, I couldn't write it. And then I was like, Oh, you can do anything you want to <laughs> like, and call it a novel, right? And Moby Dick can, can show you all that. Um, and, and I just reading it now, I know that everything that I write from here on will be inflected with Moby Dick, right? Will be um, something, some spiritual element has traversed that incredible book and is now embedded itself in my in my own soul. I read for so many different purposes, as as we all do, right? I, there's entertainment, of course, um, and then there's reading for the work at hand, and then there's reading for wildness and and short, shaking yourself up. And I, for me, my reading life happens in different planes. So the most reading I do is via audiobook. Uh, and that's a very different way of approaching a text. It's not better, it's not worse, right? It's just very different. It's a different kind of um, warp and weave and um, things go faster because you're being read too. And they, they come into your mind and little fireworks and sometimes it is uh, clarifying and sometimes you really just need the the page in order to really understand a book um so i'll i'll do audiobooks for 
entertainment purposes. And sometimes if I really love a book, I'll reread it for, for craft purposes. Um, at night, I read for um, enjoyment and to blow my own mind. Um, in the mornings when I'm working, I read for the work at hand. And so sometimes it's revisiting things like Paradise Lost or uh, Middlemarch, right? Or Emily Dickinson's poems, because there's something in the text that I found before that I want to access. And it's usually not something that you exact, you know what, what you want to access. It's just, there's a, a tenderness, a, like a flavor, um, something there. Um, yeah, I, I really feel like it's, it's our job as writers to read as much as possible, right? It's books are made out of other books and as books, um, like um come to us in our lives as well so yeah we need to we need to read more we all need to read more and in different genres and different things and things that we think we're going to hate i think um we just need we just need to fill ourselves from the well yeah no absolutely i mean because something that like the project of me starting this podcast was kind of like a, an experiment with myself to kind of question why I think certain things about books or like try to see what I can question about myself and my own reading. And I feel like part of my reading has been kind of overtly, overly critical on myself of how I read, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. And I don't know like what that is stemming from, but I mean, it's, it's always fascinating for me to hear from writers about how they, how the reading informs their work, because like, you, like you just said, there's so many different ways of reading and reading for different purposes. And I'm trying to, you know, adopt that and challenge myself and what I read and stuff like that. Like Middlemarch was like the book that really, I didn't think I was gonna like it. Like I wouldn't, I didn't really know if it was something I would wanna read, but I read it and it really blew me away and I wanna keep challenging myself. So I guess a last question for you is, where do you, like when you're gonna pick up something next, like what do you, who inspires you or how do you get that um, influence? Like, where does that come from? Oh, it's osmosis, right? So sometimes yeah. it's just the books that you're already reading and sometimes it's social media and sometimes it's a friend who says something and sometimes it's a book that you you know somehow is going to be speaking to your life in some way, right? And um, I have, you can't see it right now, but I have a whole corner full of books that I have yet to read. <laughs> like I have to go and it's kind of joyous, right? To browse those spines and just say, oh, well, maybe today's the day that I read The Baron in the Trees, which I have yet to read. A book will call to you in the time that you need it or are open to it, I think, often. And when we don't respond to books, it's not the book's fault. It's um, not our fault. It's just that there's no vibration between us right? Uh, so maybe some other time a book will really speak to us that it wouldn't have in a previous time. Yeah, that's an interesting idea to me about like, the time and place of a, of a read can really inform that because sometimes I'm like, if something's not clicking with me, but I know like all of my friends love it, or I know it's a critically acclaimed work. I'm like, right. is, is my brain not working <laughs> correctly right. to like take this in? But that's really, it's a good way of looking at it in terms of how much I feel like there's a, um, you bring yourself to a book as much as the book mm -hmm. kind of comes to you. And I think that's the beautiful conversation that's had there. Um, yeah, it's a conversation. That's exactly right. Right. I mean, yeah. And you're not always going to want to be in a conversation with the lady on the, the park bench. Yeah. Yeah. I wanted to ask one more thing. It just came to mind. I, I didn't even really get too much into like nature in this book, but I want to ask you about setting um, in Florida. Um, one of my other favorite writers, Laura Vandenberg, who I know you're friends with, yeah. I saw her in the acknowledgments. Yeah. Um, she has a book coming out, Florida Diary, which I like, it's my most anticipated book of next year. So mm -hmm. it just made me think of like Florida and asking you about how that kind of informed this, this book. Ta -da! Oh, so, so jealous. Good. It's so good. <laughs> I'm sorry. It's really amazing. Um, uh, I don't know if Florida actually influenced this book in any overt way, other than the the fact that every time you go for a run out on Painsbury, you're like, am I going to die today? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> is this the day that an alligator is going to get me or some coral snake will crawl up my sock? <laughs> yeah. Who knows? Um, yeah, but you're going to love, you're going to love Laura's book. Oh, it's so good. I cannot wait. I cannot wait. Yeah, um, well, thank you for <laughs> thank you for sharing that. And thank you so much for taking the time to join me today. When I first started this podcast, I would, you wrote like on my list of like, maybe I can one day have her on for a future book or something. Oh, so it just feels very cool to have that happen. So um, just thank you so much. And I really appreciate you taking the time. Oh my God, it's such a pleasure. Thank you. I hope I get to see you in person someday. Have Please. a great thank tour you. as well. And just thank you for taking the time. I know you have a lot going on. So I just <laughs> really want to that. not go crazy this tour. That's the one thing I always go bonkers. I go off my rocker, I come home and I have to recuperate. So that's yeah. all I want. <laughs> yeah.
take time for yeah. yourself. I hope it's great. Um, sure, it'll be really fun. So thank you so much. Oh, thank you. Thank you.